for me now when I look back and I reflect, that's where I see uh, places in my, my life that were filled with intention. Another big part, uh, I, I was the first one in our family to graduate, to go to and graduate university. And I know when I was headed to university, the question for every teen is, well, what do you want to do with your life? So I was kind of tossed. I wanted to be a fine artist. I really liked drawing and art. But then I got thinking, the only fine artists that make money have been dead 100 years. I can't wait that long. I want to buy a car. So then I said, well, maybe I'd like to get into teaching because I really enjoy um, instruction. It was shown there with my motorcycle skills. Um, but at that time in Nova Scotia, there was a surplus of teachers. So there was no work to be had. So I did the next best thing, and I became an English major. So I put that intention out. I figured, well, I speak the language. That's got to be a plus. <laughs> I can read pretty good. So that's good, too. But I was able to get a degree without doing any Shakespeare or Chaucer. And for me, that was amazing, right? Like, whoo, there it is, I'm out. So then it came, well, what am I going to do with the rest of my life, right? I've graduated. I still wasn't ready to settle down. I still hadn't found what I wanted. So then my journey took me to Barrie, Ontario, uh, where I took a program in advertising and marketing. And you know what? I think that was the, that was the best of both worlds. I got to use my creative side. Um, I got to see business, and I started looking to, to apply myself in that avenue. Um, but deep in my heart, like every little kid, I wanted to be a police officer. And back in the day, like 300 years ago when I was born, on the East Coast, policing is primarily done with the RCMP, um, also known as the GRC for the French-speaking populace in here which signifies gravel road cops, because that's what they did. They did all the outskirts <laughs> and all of that good stuff. But at that time, they had a height regulation, and I did not meet it. I could not be a cop because of that. So I let that dream, I let that dream die, or at least I thought it was dead. Little did I know it was on the back burner. But it was something I had wanted for so long. It was, it was meant to be. Um, a short time after that, Halifax Regional Police started a program uh, of community-based policing. And I became one of the first people there, similar to being an auxiliary officer, um, except we did all proactive policing. We did neighborhood watch programs. We put all of this stuff in. And I did that for a long time. I figured if I can't actually be a cop, this will be a good second. It'll keep me in the community. Um, when I was going to university, Toronto Police Service had shown uh, up at, I went to St. Mary's University in Halifax, they'd shown up, yeah, they'd shown up um, there doing a recruitment drive. Um, so I said, I'm going to go. So I went through three days of intensive training and testing, and on the third day I showed up wearing my eyeglasses and the guy lost his ever-loving mind because apparently I had wasted all of his time because I didn't meet their, their vision requirements. So, I went, oh. so again, the dream died. Um, I was sitting, maybe about a year later, uh, getting, uh, going to see my eye doctor regarding uh, contact lenses. And at that time, just pure coincidence, there's a flyer for laser correction. Never heard of this. So I asked my eye doctor about it, and he says, you're a prime candidate. All of a sudden, his dream is coming back. And because of the intention, about two weeks later, there's an advertisement in the local newspaper that Halifax Regional Police is doing a recruitment drive. And they're going to do an in-house training. And, oh, crap, here we go. So at that time, married, two kids, mortgage, the whole nine yards. My good friend from Newfoundland, from the first story, he said, it's time. You've talked about it. Either put up or shut up. So I put up. And I went into the program later in life than most of the other candidates. Um, made it through to the class of 33. It was 10 months long. And I had to get my eyes corrected with no guarantee of work. 
So literally we pulled, pulled all our savings, cashed in all the RRSPs, and said it's all or nothing. It's a big gamble. Get my eyes fixed. It was a $10,000 tuition with no guarantee of work. I graduated as the class valedictorian. It was wonderful. Got some media attention, did some interviews, didn't get a job. Nobody from the program got hired. I was like, isn't this great? <laughs> Crash and burn. So I said, I've put too much into this. My wife and I had this discussion. So I flooded Canada <laughs> with applications. And a long story short, I ended up um, in Waterloo, where I've been for the last 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. But the important part of that is in one of my jobs where I was working as a detective, I, had, I was doing something on the computer and I messed it up and I go, ah, that's so stupid. I, I can't believe how dumb I am. I, and my partner turns around, puts his hand on his shoulder and says, never say that. I go, what? He goes, you're not stupid. You're not dumb. And I go, yeah, but. He goes, no, yeah, buts. He goes, these are things that you're, you're putting out there. And that's the first time that I opened my eyes and really listened to that. And that was seven years ago, eight years ago. And I've been on a journey ever since then of looking at, we talked about intention, but also gratitude. And in a really quick, because I know I'm tight on time, but as far as the gratitude goes, I found it important to give forward, to pay it forward. Because of my artistic background, because of my creativeness uh, with creative writing and all of that stuff, I'd always wanted to do a children's book. It's something for 30 years I've wanted to do. I know, I don't look 30. But for 30 years, I've wanted to do that. And one day at work, one of my coworkers was away. Crap was hitting the proverbial fan. And I said, you know what? I really need a little bit of Hazel here. And I said, I'm going to write a book for Hazel to pass it forward. And that set it in motion. And where did we go from there? My goodness. It took me a couple of months. I had, the, I had the story written, but I didn't have it illustrated. I went to a friend of mine that's an illustrator. She couldn't do it. So again, it sits on the back burner. One of my other coworkers comes up to me, totally unrelated, and says, do you know I'm a trained illustrator? No. <laughs> and we cooked this plan to do it in secret. It took us two years to pull it all together. I had it into the final stages. I had marvelous artwork, brilliant storyline, but I couldn't put it together. I didn't know how to do that. And that's where I met, where I met Gord, on an off chance in Detroit, Michigan, in passing. Here's a guy from Waterloo you should get together with. A month after I was given his card, I contacted him. We hung out, had a coffee for three hours. And he explains to me that he's in the process of having a book published. Ba bing hey, I need to get a book published. He puts me in contact with a publisher, Lisa. And within, I would say, um, two months, I had copies of this book in my hand. So what started off uh, as, a, as a thank you has opened so many doors because the, of the, uh, the intention was there. But it wasn't for me. The intention was to give back. And I think that's really the, the striking point for me that hit home because the book is in its second printing. Um, we're in negotiations over a third printing. Uh, it is all over the world. It's, uh, where is it going? Puerto Rico? San Juan, Puerto Rico next month, month? St. Martin. Um, it's in the UK. It's, it's taken on a life of its own uh, for the sole purpose of giving back. So anyway. I want to leave that with you. I want to leave on, on uh, for my music, for my music friends. Can everybody see that? It's, it's a high note. It's an F sharp. So with that, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>